Good evening and welcome to our evening live stream. Let's join our voices all across our county and ask the Lord together to make us victorious Christians. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where Satan's rise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher But thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Well, good evening, church, and I'm glad we can spend this time for our uh, regular missions updates, uh, getting an update interview with um, Brother Paul Tabi serving in the country of Nepal. And I was able to interview him this week. And so, uh, Brother Tabi, thank you so much for um, meeting with us and uh, can you just share with us a little bit on how ministry uh, was going before the shutdown? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for letting me come and, and give you an update. I uh, love Dyer. I love uh, getting to, to share some of this stuff with you guys. Uh, but, you know, as we, as we, right before lockdown, we were getting ready for our third year anniversary at the church at Beginnings Baptist Church. And uh, so the Lord's been blessing and uh, we We've been working with two guys there. I'm sure you've read about in our reports. Uh, they're both named Akas, Akas Bakrin, and Akas Kalikote. And uh, so we've been working with them. And since we've been three years into this term, uh, we have about one more year. We'll be coming back on furlough in summer of 2021, which is about a year from now. And so we're, we're starting to prepare for, uh, for our absence and, and continue training them and, and uh, giving them more opportunities to preach. And, uh, you know, continue to teach them and prepare them to, to lead the church uh, while we're gone. Uh, we've also had the opportunity, uh, and I'm sure you've read about this, this in our updates as well, uh, working with a different people group here in Nepal, and uh, it's the Muggity people. And so we uh, had hey, the opportunity can, to start... Brother Paul, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but can you say that again? Because I know in all the updates, I, I told the people that I was butchering the pronunciation, but can you say it again <laughs> so we all get the proper pronunciation of that people group? Yeah, it's Muggity. So the Muggity people. Yes. Muggity. Okay. Uh, we've been, we started working with them about a year ago. And a good friend of mine, uh, his, his family uh, were believers and they were going to Nepali church. Uh, but he was a good friend of mine and, and he really had a burden to, to reach his own people group and very little happening in that group. And so it's, you know, 
village ministry and many villages, especially close to the Indian border. And obviously the Lord has you know, put a big burden on our heart to reach India with the gospel. Uh, that's where we were planning on going before the Lord changed, uh, changed our path. And so we started working uh, with them and, and seeing the Lord do some work there and, and had the opportunity to baptize some people and, and seeing some, seeing lives change with the gospel. And uh, there's no Bible in the Mugdi language. Uh, there's very few churches, very few believers. And so that's really where, you know, as especially with Beginnings Baptist Church, we've taken it as a mission of our church uh, to begin working with the Mugdi people. So we took a missions trip there uh, probably four or five months ago. Uh, to some Mugavi villages and uh, showed some Jesus films and met some people in some houses and and uh, shared the gospel and uh, so that's really you know as as we move forward in the ministry that's that's our our goal as a church and as as missionaries is to see unreached people groups like that uh, come to Christ. <laughs> yeah. So you guys, um, if I remember correctly, uh, just like maybe a month ago. Um, you like bought a property and started building a a, a building for the Muggity, the the Bible study, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we rented a piece of property. It's a long term lease for like ten years, and uh, it's right next to the the place where we were meeting in in my friend's house. And so we have started the building. We actually met there. It's it's not completely um, built in, but after the the quarantine, the uh, the COVID nineteen started coming out and they were telling us you know to be more careful and meet in smaller groups and and be farther apart uh we weren't able all to fit into his living room and so we met out in the church open air service uh our first our first service in the new building it, it wasn't even completely finished but um we're excited about what the lord's doing there wow that's pretty cool so um tell me uh, in your most recent update you talked about um a conference that you had recently at the camp refuge uh building site can you tell us about that yeah it was our first big we've had some smaller meetings there uh, but we had our first uh multi-church we invited other churches other uh, baptist churches uh, here in Kathmandu, and i think there's five or six churches that were present there and uh, so on holy is one of the big hindu holidays here and uh, the entire city is is um, closed for the entire day and so it's you know hindus are all out partying all day and having uh, different festivals and different things going on a lot of different worship at the temples mm -hmm. and so it's always been since we came here five years ago um, i've noticed among our christian friends and brothers and sisters that you know it's really kind of a depressing day just kind of sitting at, in your house all day and, and not really anything to do. Uh, a lot of churches didn't have services those days. And uh, so one of our first things we, when we, Lord gave us the camp property and, and provide with the building. And uh, we started being able to have groups there. We really wanted to have uh, something that we could invite all the Christians there. And so we, on that day, we went from morning all the way till uh, I think seven, eight o'clock at night and uh, we just had uh, services all day long, played games, and just enjoyed Christian fellowship. Uh, we even had some unbelievers that, that came with their friends, and so instead of uh, being out doing idol worship and, and having, you know, playing games with the world, uh, they had the opportunity to, to see the fellowship between Christians and hear the gospel, and uh, so we're, we're excited about doing that every single year and uh, see the Lord work there at the camp and and obviously, once the, the coronavirus is finished, we'll be having more events there and preaching the gospel through through the camp ministry as well. Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Which, I'm just going to put a bug in everybody's ear that, uh, you know, we as a church need to go visit them sometime. And uh, You're welcome. when you, you made a video of Camp Refuge um, a while ago, and you showed the panorama out on the like the top floor and I was like, oh, it's so beautiful. I yeah. know that's carnal <laughs> motives for wanting to visit you, but. <laughs> so tell us, just tell us really briefly um, what your lockdown looks like there in Kathmandu and what ministry looks like now for you. 
Yeah, we're, for the past 12, 12 days, we've been on pretty strict lockdown uh, where, you know, we're not allowed to leave the house other than uh, going to the shops. And really, even the local shops, uh, pretty much everything's been closed. And there's one local shop that we can go to and get uh, vegetables and, and milk and different things. And uh, so we, obviously, we haven't been able to have church services, so we've been doing uh, services online. And we've, uh, we meet with both the churches. We brought them both together at the Mugley Church and, uh, and our beginning Baptist church. And so we've been doing... Uh, We've been doing online services just like many churches in the states have and uh, we're just you know we're we're trying to as much as possible to any neighbors that we come in contact with anybody close uh, you know trying to be a blessing to help to people around us because uh, just like in the states you know people are, are really struggling here out of work and uh, you know trying to make sure they have everything they need and, and have their um, family taken care of. And so I'll just give you one quick example. We had uh, a neighbor of ours, all the bakeries are closed. And uh, so his, his kid's birthday, he wasn't able to get a cake. And mm. so you know, we spent the day baking a cake for them. I've never met him before. So it was a great opportunity uh, to meet some of our neighbors and, and ha provide a cake for their birthday. And uh, so we're, we're hoping for more interactions like that and, and take this opportunity to, uh, to serve the Lord and be a witness and a light um, in any situation that that God gives us. Very good. So how can we as Dyer Baptist Church, um, maybe two or three specific prayer requests for you guys uh, as a family, as a ministry um, here in the next month? Yeah, I think with our, uh, with our online services, because um, everybody's out of work, everybody's closed. Um, you know, we're, we're meeting with some people that haven't been coming to church in a long time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one guy in particular named Santos. He's a friend of Akasa's, and he was coming to church pretty faithfully. And uh, about two years ago, he got a job. He got a secular job, and um, he's an unbeliever. He's never made a profession of Christ. He was getting really close. He was really starting to understand and and uh, and, and think about eternity, think about uh, salvation and the gospel. And after getting that job, he's only been to church maybe once or twice in the past two years. And uh, really the world just kind of pulled him back in and busyness of life. Uh, but he's been attending our online services because he's just sitting at his house. And so pray for things like that. You know, I think the Lord's going to use, um, obviously the Lord's at work in, in all times. And I think he's going to use uh, the, this time of lockdown and quarantine in a special way in people's lives. So pray for, for more yeah. opportunities for us. Uh, pray for our family um, that, that we continue to be able to find everything we need and uh, that we more importantly that we would do even in this time what we came here uh, to Kathmandu to do and that is to uh, preach the gospel and to love people and to serve people and bring them to Christ uh, so that's that's really what we need prayer for thanks that's a great perspective well brother Tavi thanks for joining us and uh, may God bless you and your family and we'll be praying for you guys I appreciate it look forward to seeing you all again soon Dear God, thank you so much that we're able to have this time to talk to you about the Tobies. I pray that you would just help them as they're working on this new experience as well as we are, Lord. I pray that you would help them with their um, online services. I know he mentioned that he was able to have contact with the gentleman that he hadn't been able to reach as well, Lord. I pray you would help him to get saved. I pray that you would help their family as they're working on finding the things that they need to everyday supplies, Lord. I pray you'd help them not to have a struggle, but that they'll be able to find that. And also, God, help them as they're trying to find ways to serve people in this time. I pray that you'd help them to be able to do that. Thank you, God, that he was able to just give a brief update on what's happening at their uh, mission. Um, thank you, God, that they're able to reach the Muggity people, and they're seeing people saved there. And Lord, I pray that you'd help them to find a Bible, or find get a translation for the Bible. And Lord, thank you that they're able to have meetings at their camp. Um, thank you that they're able to have that fellowship even during their, you know, you talked about that religious um, holiday. Thank you, God, they're able to have a meeting and spend the whole day just having services and games and having fellowship with other Christians. Thank you, God, that they're able to do that. 
And I pray that you would um, help them as they're getting men ready for to take over while they go on their furlough. Thank you that they're able to have men that are faithful and willing to do this. I pray, God, that you would help them as they're getting them ready to take over the ministry while they're here in the States on their furlough. I pray you'd help them to um, have your peace and guidance as they're working on preparing for that. And Lord, I pray you'd help them as they're getting their building ready still. Um, they were able to use it for a service, but definitely to be able to finish it would be a blessed thing for them. I'm, I know it would be. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them even tonight. Give them a extra special blessing in your name. Amen. As we mentioned this morning, feel free to stand in your homes if you'd like as we sing together, I Am Resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him Hasten so glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what He saith, do what He willeth, He is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. The trusting to Jesus please, nor many ill forebodes, but at the cross of Calvary sings, praise God for lifted loads, singing I go along my sword, praising the Lord, praising the Lord, singing I go along my sword, for Jesus has lifted my soul. Days bring many cares, fear not, I hear him say. And when my fears are turned to prayers, the burdens slip away. Singing, I go along my sword, praising the Lord, praising the Lord. Singing, I go along my sword, for Jesus has lifted my Lord. Good evening. On Sunday nights, we've been studying relationships. Now, last Sunday night was different as we celebrated the resurrection and thought about uh, those important questions relating to Christ and his resurrection. And so tonight, we get back to this study of relationships. Uh, we've been for a few weeks now talking about the core concept of commitment. That if we are to have fruitful, profitable, healthy relationships, we need to have a degree of commitment in all of them. Now granted, some relationships um, warrant or call for more commitment than others. Your marriage co relationship calls for more commitment than your relationship to the person at the checkout at the grocery store. Um, but all relationships, I believe, do require some degree of commitment. And uh, commitment is, is simply showing that you value a person 
and therefore value your relationship with that person. Showing that that relationship is not disposable because that person is not disposable. You remember we talked about a, a napkin and a plastic fork. Th those things aren't important to us because we're just going to get rid of them. And, and people sometimes treat other people that way. And, and because they're not committed to that person and committed to that relationship, um, they're sending the message that you're not important to me, you're not valuable to me. And every person should matter to us. Every person should be valuable to us because every person has a living soul that God created and that, that Jesus died for. And because he loves them, we should love them too. When I demonstrate commitment in a relationship, I'm, I'm showing steadiness. I'm showing uh, regularity, faithfulness. I'm, I'm being dependable. I, I'm not flighty. I'm not unreliable. And I hope that as Christians, we develop that kind of a, of a testimony or a reputation that, hey, that Christian can be counted on. They're faithful. They're committed to the relationships in which they are. Do words like loyal and faithful come up when people talk about you? Or is that the last thing that would enter their mind? I, I hope that people get the message from you, even if you don't say it in words, that, hey, I'm sticking with you through good times and through bad times. Even if we have misunderstandings, even if my feelings get hurt or I hurt your feelings, we're not going to walk away from each other. We're going to work this out. We're going to talk it through, and we will come out of this stronger on the other side. This evening, then, I'd like us to consider the question, how should we demonstrate commitment to our neighbors? I mostly will be thinking tonight about or actual neighbors, like the people that live in the house close to you, or maybe it's, it's your housemate or your roommate, or maybe it's um, the people in the apartment complex or apartment building where you are. Those literal neighbors. Certainly in Scripture, the term neighbor can be apl applied much more broadly than that. It can be applied to anyone that you come in contact with. We'll see that later in the account of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. Uh, but for the beginning of this study of commitment to our neighbors, we'll be looking at some principles from the book of Proverbs. Don't you love Proverbs? There's just such a, a practical, immediate application sense to, to those Proverbs that just really teach us how to live and, and how to have wisdom. That's why Solomon wrote them, to give wisdom and understanding and subtlety. Consider this question then, what would happen for the cause of Christ if all Christians were great neighbors? What, what if... You, and you, and you, and you, and everybody who's watching this live stream, every believer, everyone who names the name of Christ, suddenly became the best neighbor on their block, or the, or the best neighbor in that apartment building, or wherever you find yourself. What would happen if we showed commitment to our neighbors such that it became kind of a, a, a thing that, hey, if you've got a Christian neighbor, you've got a good neighbor? What would it do for the kingdom of Christ and for the salvation of souls if all Christians showed commitment to their neighbors in good times and in bad times? I'd like you to first of all find Proverbs chapter 3, verse 28. Proverbs 3:28, as we consider showing commitment to our neighbors. Proverbs 3:28. If you find it, follow along with me, please. Proverbs 3:28. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again tomorrow. I will give when thou hast it by thee. Let me read it this way. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. The idea is your neighbor comes and asks to borrow something, and you have it, and you could give it to them, but instead of giving it to them, you say, well, I tell you what, come back tomorrow, and, and I'll give it to you then. Let me ask you, why would you say that to your neighbor? If you have that thing, like maybe it's, um, I don't know, let me just get something out of the pulpit here. Um, <laughs> maybe it's a remote control, okay? Whatever, it's a tool, it's something, it's an object that your neighbor wants, and they say, hey, can I borrow that? And you have it right there, and you tell your neighbor, um, I'll give it to you tomorrow. What is the very likely motivation behind the person who says, I'll loan it to you tomorrow? 
Well, as I know my own heart, I'm saying I'll give it to you tomorrow because tomorrow, I'm hoping that they won't come back and ask tomorrow. I hope that they'll forget. I hope that they'll not be patient enough and they'll go borrow it from somebody else because I don't really care about them enough to, to really want to help them. If I help them, I'm going to do it grudgingly or um, by dragging my feet and kind of slowly giving it to them. I had something like this happen, I think it was this last summer. I had a neighbor um, who was doing a lot of yard work, some heavy yard work, and uh, he knew that I had a pretty good wheelbarrow. It was left at our house when he bought the house, but it was an old wheelbarrow, which meant it had a good solid tire and had, had nice heavy uh, metal parts to it. And uh, my neighbor said, can I borrow your wheelbarrow? And, and I felt this temptation that ta talked about in Proverbs 3.28. I, I thought, yeah, okay. I should let you borrow my wheelbarrow. Um, i tell you what, I'll get it for you out of the shed tomorrow. And I remembered this verse. I thought, I can't do that. I need to stop what I'm doing and go and get my wheelbarrow for him right now. Because if I wanted a wheelbarrow, I would want it now. I wouldn't want to have to wait. Um, it's, it's easy to put off somebody who wants to borrow from us when we're not really eager to help them. But if we are eager to help them, if we value that neighbor and if we appreciate them and if we're committed to that relationship, we're going to say, look, your priority is my priority. And if you want a wheelbarrow, it's a wheelbarrow you're going to get. Let me stop what I'm doing. Let me show my commitment to you. Go get that wheelbarrow so I don't hold you up from your project and your task. If, if we show commitment to our neighbor because we value them, we will be eager to help not grudging to help. Have you ever gotten help from somebody, but you knew they didn't really want to help you? <laughs> it, it's kind of tempting to say, never mind, I'll just do it myself. I, I'd rather have extra work than unwilling help. That, that's sometimes how we feel, and that's what this proverb addresses. We need to show that we value our neighbors and demonstrate commitment to them by being eager to help them, not grudging. And then look at the very next verse, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 29. It says this, Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. All right, well, the first half says don't um, dream up something bad against your neighbor. The word devise there has a, a root meaning of, of like to scratch, as if you were to create something or carve something. You're, you're, you're coming up and in, with something and inventing it. So don't devise or plan out something. Don't create something that's evil against your neighbor. Evil just means bad. It's just not good for them. Don't, don't come up with something that's going to be harmful for your neighbor. Seen or because he dwelleth securely by thee. That's the idea of dwelling in safety. And, and I think it kind of cuts both ways. If you have a good neighbor and they live by you, they're safe because they're by you, and you're a little bit safer because they're by you. Isn't it nice if you have a good neighbor and you're going to be out of town for a while to be able to say, hey, we're going to be gone. Could you kind of watch over the place for a while? That's the idea of dwelling securely by your neighbor. You're not out in the open alone. You're, you're dwelling safely side by side with your neighbor. And, and so verse 29 tells us, don't devise evil against your neighbor because he dwells safely beside you. So the second thing we learn about commitment in our neighbors is that we should remember that they are an ally. Do you think of your neighbors as an ally, as, as partners, as um, co-laborers, as people in the same cause with you? Devise not evil against thy neighbor because they're an ally. Don't create problems for them. Now, I'm not going to ask you to um, make a comment in the Facebook stream or the YouTube stream and, and confess as to when you made problems for your neighbor, but isn't it true that sometimes it's tempting to make problems for our neighbors, especially when they do something that inconveniences us or that we don't like? We say, oh, that's the way it is, huh? Well, I'm going to do this to you, and we devise or we plan, we scratch out an evil idea towards our neighbor. Oh yeah? You're not going to mow your grass? It's going to look long and nappy and, and unpleasant? It's going to drop the value of my real estate? Well, I tell you what, I'll mow my grass, but I'll put all my clippings on your yard. Or um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll sweep in front of my curb and I'll leave a big dirt pile by your curb or whatever. Don't devise mischief or evil against your neighbor. Don't, don't develop problems for them. Don't create evil for them. 
Um, Proverbs 11 um, kind of ties into this idea. It says, he that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor. He says it's a really foolish thing to hate your neighbor. To, to have this venomous relationship with your neighbor is a foolish thing. You're, you're stuck with them. You're beside them. And uh, it's better, Proverbs eleven twelve says, to hold your peace. Don't, don't give your neighbor a piece of your mind. Don't argue with them. Don't create problems with them. Have peace with them because they dwell securely by you. Now, let me tell you a little illustration. I live in the town of Dyer, um, just a little bit east of the, the church here. And uh, in the town of Dyer, it, it seems that the, the town code or ordinance regarding outdoor burning is um, kind of subject to interpretation. And so you'll see signs sometimes that say, no open burning in town. Well, what does it mean to burn in the open? Is lighting a match burning in the open? Do you have to have like a, a, an actual fire pit that you buy, you know, at Menards or something? Or can you build a fire pit out of blocks? Or can you have a campfire as long as you're there attending it and roasting hot dogs? It, it's really kind of vague sometimes. And I will tell you that in my neighborhood, everybody has fires outside. I mean, there are campfires and bonfires all over the neighborhood all the time. And sometimes those campfires smell better than others. Sometimes it's a nice, clean, burning fire. Sometimes people burn something that's a little bit wet or junky. Then it doesn't smell so good. And, and it might be a nice autumn day or, or a cool summer night. And we open our windows in our house, and then, oh, all of a sudden we smell that fire, and, and we don't like it. And I can tell you that there is a temptation to um, devise evil against our neighbor. Say, so, you know what, all it would take would be a call to the local police and say, you know, uh, there's a neighbor of mine that they're having a fire and it doesn't seem to be contained. I think you should come and check it out. And probably the police would come and tell them that they have to put out their fire. I, I could do that. And sometimes I'm tempted to devise evil against my neighbor. But Proverbs 3.29 says, Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. The thing about calling the police on your neighbors for something that's annoying you, that's not really, really a problem, is that people have a way of finding out who it was that called the police. And if everybody in my neighborhood finds out that I'm the guy who always calls when they have their fires, what's going to that do for my testimony? How's it going to be the next time I invite them to a neighborhood Bible backyard club? or invite them to vacation Bible school, or invite them to church. Oh yeah, call the police on me and then invite me to church. Yeah, some neighbor you are. It says he dwells securely by thee. If I get known for being the tattletale in the neighborhood who's devised evil for my neighbors, then what if somebody really is breaking and entering into my house? Do you think my neighbors are going to be inclined to, to help me out and to call the police for my protection? No, they're going to say, well, he's getting what he deserved because he was always bad to us. We're not going to do any good for him. The scriptures teach us it is foolish to devise evil against your neighbor. You can show commitment to them by saying, you know what? Even if you bother me once in a while, I don't appreciate something that you're doing. I I'm not going to create evil plans. I'm not going to look for ways to get back at you. I'm going to make peace with you like Proverbs 11:12 says. So um, Proverbs 3.28 teaches us that we need to let our neighbors borrow our wheelbarrows. And Proverbs 3.29 teaches us that when our, our neighbors annoy us, we don't call the town code enforcer to come and make them toe the line. Well, that's the lesson I've learned from these Proverbs. Anyhow, let's, let's move on to another proverb and see what else we can learn about showing commitment to our neighbors and being stable, faithful, loyal neighbors to them. Proverbs 25, verse 8. Find that if you would, please. Let's look at Proverbs 25, verse 8. It says this, Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Ooh, this is, a, this is an important proverb. This, this kind of reminds me of, of the one about answering a matter before you hear it. When you... When you um, make your statement, and when you come out strong and you haven't heard the whole story, you may end up having to eat your words. You, you may realize that, you know what, I was too hasty in what I said. Proverbs 25.8 says, don't, don't quickly strive with your neighbor. And the word strive there has the connotation of really like taking them to court, going to the judge and saying, hey, my neighbor did this wrong thing. It's talking about bringing in the authorities. So go not forth hastily to strive, 
lest or so that you don't know what to do in the end thereof when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. In other words, you, you, you sue your neighbor and then when you go to court, your neighbor's found innocent and, and you don't have any grounds against them and the judge says, quit bothering your neighbor and now you're embarrassed because you made this big, huge stink about it uh, and you were in the wrong and your neighbor was in the right. You, um, you better make really, really sure that the neighbor is wrong and the neighbor is illegal and the neighbor needs to be dealt with by the law before you go stirring up a lot of trouble. Um, otherwise, you're going to be ashamed that, that you made an issue over something that wasn't an issue. Um, this, this reminds me of something else that's happened in our neighborhood. When we first moved into our house, the way our lot is, is our house is kind of on the side of a, a lot that's kind of double wide. It's, it's a shallow lot, but it's a wide lot. And so our house is here, and then we have this kind of open space where there's a lot of grass, and that's where we like to throw frisbee and play soccer and stuff like that. And then it goes over to the neighbor's property. Well, early on when we moved into that lot, a lot of the people that lived behind us when they wanted to, to get out of the block and out onto the street, they would, they would go across the, the far side of our lot. And um, it's one thing to walk, but a lot of people in our neighborhood have um, fun uh, grown-up toys, I call them. They have golf carts, they have gator carts, they have four-wheelers, they have dirt bikes, they have, they have all kinds of motorized vehicles that they drive all around just for the fun of it, really. And, and so it wasn't just that people were walking across our yard, they were driving their big toys ac across our yard. And eventually I was getting a little irritated, like, hey, that's our property, you know, and maybe you need to get out, but you could at least come and ask, you could at least, you know, apologize or wave or do something, but you're just acting like you own the place. And, and I got a little miffed about it. And it wasn't until some time later that I thought about it and I realized, you know what, there's NIPSCO poles through there, and, and there's other utilities and it finally dawned on me that really that's probably not my property. That's more of a, a, a utility right-of-way um, that doesn't belong to me. And if I had made a big stink about it, hey, you're on my property. You better get off of this. Don't you know that this is America and you can't go traipsing over other people's private property? If I had made a big stink of it, I might have been embarrassed and made a fool of myself when I found out that actually that's more of an alley than it is your personal property and you have no right to it. Do you see the type of thing we're talking about here when he says in Proverbs 25, 8, Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. Don't, don't be quick to get into confrontation and strife and, and um, especially legal issues with your neighbors. And certainly, if there ever is a legal issue, make sure that you tell the truth and don't lie about your neighbor. Um, Proverbs 25, 18, same chapter, 25, 18 says, A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. So, so don't pick a legal fight with your neighbor and certainly don't lie about your neighbor, painting him out to be worse than he is. So commitment to my neighbor looks like letting them borrow things and, and being um, eager to help them. Commitment to my neighbor means um, not causing problems for them because he's your ally. Commitment to our neighbor means um, thinking twice before getting involved in a confrontation with them, um, knowing that um, I'll be embarrassed if I ended up being wrong about this. One more principle from Proverbs uh, about commitment to our neighbors we'll find in chapter 27. So turn now over to Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs 27. Verse 10. Proverbs 27, 10. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. Isn't that kind of the definition of commitment? It's not forsaking, it's not giving up, it's not quitting on them. Don't forsake your friend or your father's friend, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity. For better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. I have to confess to you that I've misread this verse a number of times, but I hope I can clearly explain it to you tonight. The first half says, um, don't forsake your friend or even a family friend, like your parents' friends. And then it says in the second half, neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity. 
I often read this verse and skipped over the little word thy, and I thought it was talking about someone else's calamity, but it's not. It's talking about my calamity. It says, when I'm in calamity, I shouldn't go to my brother's house because what's actually better for me is my neighbor than my brother who's far off. Let me see if I can explain it this way. Um, be faithful and loyal to your friends. Show commitment to them and don't quit on your relationships. If, you're, if your parents were friends with your neighbors before you or, or, or with somebody who lives down the street, you maintain that friendship. You be committed. You keep up that relationship with your friends, uh, your old friends, and your family friends. Keep up those relationships. And if you have a problem, if you have a crisis and, and a need, you may actually get better help from that neighbor, from that friend who's close to you, close to you in heart, perhaps close to you in location. You'll get better help from them than you will from a relative, a blood brother, who's, who's not close to you, either not close to you in heart or not close to you in location. That, that makes a lot of sense. The Proverbs are very, very practical and wise. Think of it this way. Um, during the summer months, our family usually goes away for, for a stretch of time, um, and that's when the grass is growing. And if the grass were to be unmowed the whole time that we're gone, uh, it would be like a jungle when we got back. But I can tell you that whenever I've gone out of town like that, I've never asked my, my brother-in-law, my true family, my, my sister's husband, I've never asked him to come and mow our lawn while we're gone for this extended period during the summer. The simple reason is they live in Valparaiso. They are an hour away. How am I going to have the nerve to ask my brother-in-law, hey, would you stop everything and find a way to get all the way over here to Dyer and mow my lawn for me while I'm gone? When I have good neighbors, I have friends around me that live close, and I could just say to them, hey, could you do me a favor and, and mow my lawn once while I'm gone, and I'll, I'll do something to make it up to you. You see, in the day of my calamity, not being able to mow my grass, I can get better help from a neighbor who's close than I can from my brother, who, who is a great brother-in-law, but, but he's far off. And how many times do we foolishly not show commitment to those that live close to us, and therefore we don't have somebody to help us in time of need. We need to be there for our neighbors because we're close to them, and we need to develop a relationship and upkeep a relationship with them so that they'll be for, there for us in our time of need. So a good neighbor is more helpful than a distant relative. And so don't let go of your friends or your, or your neighbors. Be there for them. A friend whose heart and presence are near to you can help you in a problem more than a relative who isn't as close. These then are some great ways that we can practically demonstrate commitment to our neighbors, and I hope you will. Again, let's ask ourselves the question, what would happen if every Christian, if every member of Dyer Baptist Church became a great neighbor? What would that do for our testimony? I'd like us to see... Um, <laughs> I'd like us to see one quick illustration of this out of the mouth of Jesus. So turn please to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 10 that is, Luke chapter 10. Um, a man came to Jesus and uh, asked him some questions. And, and Jesus talked with him and talked about how it's important for us to love our neighbor as ourself. That's the, the second great commandment. And uh, then... The, the man that was talking to Jesus kind of wanted to limit who he had to love as himself. And so he asked Jesus to define neighbor. And, and he said in Luke uh, chapter 10, um, let's see here. Luke chapter 10, uh, verse 29, he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who do I have to love as myself? And then Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. So I want us to read this and think about the principles from Proverbs that we just learned and see if this man from Samaria truly was a good neighbor demonstrating commitment to the man who was wounded and hurt in this passage. So listen uh, as I read the story of the Good Samaritan. Be asking yourself questions about commitment to our neighbor as, as we um, look at this illustrated for us by Jesus. Luke 10, I'll start reading in verse 30. Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, 
which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So the, the priest passed by on the other side. Verse 32, And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, who, who should have been like a natural enemy for the man who was wounded, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Now Jesus asks the question, Which now of these three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? Jesus paints the picture of what it looks like to be a good neighbor, to be a committed neighbor. Notice that the Samaritan was eager to help. He's walking along and he sees the man there wounded, and, and he doesn't just walk on by. He stops to help. I, I, I tremble to think, what would I have done in that situation? Did I really want to be bothered? Did, did I want to just pretend I didn't see it? Or did I have a heart that was eager to help? We, we saw also that the Samaritan did not add to the trouble. He didn't devise mischief. He said, oh, the, the, the people from Jerusalem are natural enemies of the Samaritans. And so since this guy's already been beaten up, I'll check and see if the robbers left anything and I'll, I'll take whatever's left. Or I've always been upset with the Jews, so I'll kick him while he's down just because it'll feel good. He didn't devise mischief or evil against him. He didn't make problems for him. The, the good Samaritan, in fact realized that, you know what, I'm close to him, I'm passing by, and so he helped him. Our, our actual neighbors are, are closer to us in, in a more substantial fashion than this was. Uh, the Samaritan was just passing by. Your neighbors are there all the time. How much more should we show commitment to them? And so he did. He showed tremendous commitment to them. He had compassion on him. He got close to him. He, he changed his schedule. Are you willing to change your schedule so you can help your neighbor? He gave up convenience. The, the man was greatly inconvenienced by, by, by helping the one who had been robbed. He gave up his equipment. He, he let him ride on his own beast. Uh, he gave up his money. He gave the innkeeper two pence or, or two days wages. When's the last time you gave uh, your neighbor two days wages, let alone a complete stranger? He did all of this simply because he happened to be nearby. Are you committed in that way to your neighbors just because they're nearby? Do you, do you give them compassion? Do you give them um, your time? Do you give them your money? Do you help them? I hope that we will. Because at the end of Jesus' story, verse 37, he, um, Jesus asked the man, Who do you think was a neighbor? to the one that fell among thieves. And the man that was talking with Jesus said, I suppose he that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. Jesus is commanding you and he's commanding me to be like the good Samaritan, to show commitment and generosity and compassion and help to the neighbors that are around us. That's Christ's command for us. I hope that we'll be obedient and and. and, and cultivate the relationships that we have with our neighbors by showing commitment to them. And maybe the next time we want to invite our neighbors to come to church, they'll be more likely to listen. Maybe the next time we, we bring Jesus into the conversation and talk about eternal life, maybe they'll pay more attention to what we have to say because they've seen the commitment that we have towards them. Well, brothers and sisters, we all have neighbors. And I don't know your neighbors and you don't know mine. I know they're, they're not perfect, but let's all band together and say, yes, we're going to try to show Christian commitment to our neighbors. Recently, I, I finished reading the book of 1 Corinthians again, and um, I was touched by the closing that Paul gave to uh, the church there at Corinth, and I, I wanted to read it to you because it, it um, kind of 
summarizes my feelings as well. 1 Corinthians 16, 23 and 24 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. I want to wish to you the grace of Christ, knowing that I love you and miss you and look forward to when our fellowship will be renewed. May God strengthen you as we seek to live for him this week.